Looking back on my barrio, it could have been described as the barrio of chug holes and a book desert. I mean, there were no libraries on the west side of town. There were no libraries in most of the schools. My school did not have a library in the classroom, in the school itself, in the neighborhood. Um, we just didn't have it. So you might think, based on that, that we were very literarily poor. And no, we were, we were wealthy with literature, but it was an oral literature. It was literature that people passed down in the stories that they told. Um, there, there would be everything from corridos to bedtime stories that were polished and were passed on for generations. The story of La Llorona was more than 500 years old. It's been being told on this continent since before Europeans arrived. And um, it, it was a story that we all knew very well. Well, that's literature, but it's an oral literature. The impact on my writing today is that people keep telling me, you're so good at script writing. You know, you make things sound like real voices. I said, yes, because in my mind, the best literature is the literature of the human voice. It's oral literature. And so we had everything, dichos, bilingual jokes, things that captured the fun and the power of language in the only formats that were available to many people who had been deprived of an opportunity for education or literacy. We were hungry to see our experience because none of the books had us in them. I mean, we were all excited in fourth grade when they finally mentioned Mexicans in the Texas history book. But the way they mentioned them and the way they depicted them were really bad. I mean, we practically had vampire uh, canines sticking out of our mouths, fangs and blood and you know, saliva dripping. And we looked very evil crawling over the walls to kill the poor defenders of the Alamo. We never heard that there were Mexico Tejano defenders of the Alamo. You know, we never heard the other side of the story. And we just knew that we never saw ourselves. And we had a rich experience. It wasn't a deprived experience. It was culturally wealthy. But it wasn't reflected in anything that we could read in a book. So all the way going through school, I felt, and not just me, all my friends, hunger to see Latinos. So we'd invent things. We would say, you know, Barretta? Yeah, he's called Robert Blake, but it's probably Roberto Blanco. Yeah, yeah, he probably changed his name to make it in Hollywood. He looks Mexican, he talks Mexican, he walks Mexican, he's gotta be a Mexican. Because we were so hungry to see ourselves reflected. There wasn't anything. Furthermore, we were punished for speaking Spanish or even pronouncing our own names correctly. So it was against state law until the year I graduated from high school to speak a foreign language on school grounds. They really didn't care about the other languages. They s basically focused on do not speak Spanish. And they thought they were doing us a favor because if you bind somebody's mouth and don't let them speak Spanish, then this fluent English is gonna pop out, right? No, it didn't work that way. We just got very quiet when the teachers got near. When the teachers left, it was, híjole, por qué no nos deja hablar? No más que decir, you know. So we didn't kill our Spanish but it made us feel hungry for our language and our culture. And people don't know, some don't, that this was the method of discipline used. This is a real paddle from one of the schools. And it's wood, and it's thick, and it has holes drilled in it so you can hit faster and leave marks and bruises. And, uh, and some kids had their names written all over it, you know. Uh, it was sad. And so it created what could be called a dropout problem, but was actually a push-out problem. So my desire was to do something that would bring those stories, those beautiful stories that I heard all around me in the neighborhood, even stories of grandparents or tías or tíos told you, vecinos, ay, en esa casa vivía una muchacha, después vino, un día se fue al baile, and you hear the muchacha que bailó con el diablo, or the angelitos at the railroad crossing that would push the car over, all these rich, rich stories that we never got to see in print. So when the Chicano movement came along and the Chicano literary movement in the late 60s and the early 70s, I thought that was the best thing in the whole wide world. I had been raised um, 
with activism. I don't want to give the idea that Chicano movement started everything. I think Mexican Americans here, I know Mexican Americans here were aware of the discriminatory situations from the very time that Mexican Americans existed when, when the Republic of Texas and then the United States took over Texas. And we became not part of Mexico, but part of a, an English dominant uh, society. Um, but I know as a child that there were already complaints and organizations within the neighborhood in the 1950s complaining to the city that the, the police didn't come to the west side when we called. They were scared of the west side. Uh, the police didn't come, the streets weren't fixed, the libraries weren't put in, the parks weren't taken care of on our side of town. And the first time I appeared in a newspaper article, I was four years old, sitting in a chug hole with a, uh, a yardstick measuring the depth of it because my aunt was part of a group complaining about the chug holes in front of our house on San Fernando Street. And uh, so the one Mexican American that worked for the paper came to check it out and, and she says, Ta mas profundo, this hole is, is bigger than my niece. And he says, stick your niece in there. So they stuck me in the, the hole I had been playing in the street because that was our entertainment area. We didn't have a park. So I've got dirt all over my face and my hands. And then my mother says, oh, no, no, let me change you into her nice dress. We, had, we all had one nice dress, the one that you wore when you went to be a flower girl in a wedding or whatever, you know, and keep it for like five or six years. It just kept getting shorter. So she stuck me in my nice front dress. And then I made the... San Antonio Light, which was one of the two newspapers that we had in town at that time. I think uh, writing was kind of in my blood and in my barrio. <laughs> it just that it was all oral. And uh, my mother liked to write things down, whether it was a grocery list or letters to people. She loved to write things down. Um, on my father's side, some of my aunts had, had written stories. I didn't know it at that time. Um, I, just, I just felt some kind of a, an attraction to being a writer. I didn't even know you could be a writer, that that was an option as a, as a profession. Um, you know, the only options we were told about was construction worker, maid, uh, maybe you could be a teacher if you studied. The schools didn't tell us that, but our families did. Um, and so when I was about nine years old, I saw a show on TV about this woman that was a writer. And she had a typewriter and she would type. And I just thought this was so exciting to be able to take these stories and put them in a way that could reach more people. Little did I know that years later, um, that would mean that things that I wrote would reach people on the other side of the planet that I had never met but that they would appreciate and be touched by something and identify with something that I wrote about here. Because as human beings, we're very close. We're all connected. We're really all familia. And literature that travels the world allows us to see that and to feel that. I went to West Side schools. At that time, um, they were not uh, very affirming of our culture or our language. They were suppressing of it. And um, the images that we got of ourselves from the schools were also very negative. Um, we were constantly lectured in homeroom to give up our switchblades. I didn't have a switchblade, but I wanted one so I could give it up. You know, I mean, give up your switchblades, you know. And uh, we were lectured on this. The image that the teachers had of us was that we were gang kids, we were rough kids. The middle school I went to was considered the roughest junior high in town. Um, and they would frisk us going in and out of the cafeteria every day. The boys would be frisked to find out if they had switchblades. And the girls would have their purses checked. And in those days, you know, these little girls are just starting to feel like big women. So they're carrying their purses with maybe a, a mirror in there, a comb, a lipstick, maybe a perfume bottle. And it was all glass in those days. And uh, so and they would also check us to make sure we didn't have teased hair, because that was the big style, those big bouffant teased hair. Um, so they would ask, you know, you know, to take us through. They checked to make sure we didn't have teased hair. And, and we'd say, ma'am, 
how come we kind of have teased hair? So, oh, because if you get into a fight, you're going to reach into your hair, you're going to pull out the knife, and you're going to stab somebody. And we'd say, oh, ma'am, how come we can't have perfume bottles and mirrors in our purses? Oh, because if you get into a fight, you're going to take that mirror, you're going to break it, and you're going to slash somebody with it. We'd say, oh, and we learned a lot in junior high, <laughs> but it wasn't what they had planned in the curriculum. The stereotype of who we were, their awareness of what our culture taught was way off from reality. And um, so we were not really uh, given a very high image of ourselves. Um, we had choices of electives like wood shop, metal shop, auto mechanics, uh, homemaking. Those were the options. And um, it took a while for that to change in the schools. Um, the principal once told me uh, that I had potential to make it all the way to high school. He didn't say through high school, he just said to high school, which kind of told you, he said, you're smart, you could make it all the way to high school. So that meant his expectation was that most students wouldn't. And I was in eighth grade when he said this. So uh, the way they viewed us was negative. Fortunately, Mexican-American culture, Hispanic culture, has a great reverence for education. We really do. We even talk about being educados, and educados means so much more than just schooling. It means diplomacy, courtesy, humanity, knowing how to treat people, ser bien educados. Um, and we also respect teachers. Mexico has uh, Dia de la Maestra, and people who are doctors, lawyers, uh, social workers, uh, presidents, they look up their teacher from fourth grade or from sixth grade or from first grade and send them flowers and serenade them. And we have a great reverence for education. So at home, we were hearing, learn more, speak two languages. Cada cabeza, la, la, la persona que habla dos lenguas tiene dos cabezas. Y cada cabeza es un mundo. So here we were owners of two worlds. So we were getting our encouragement for education, not from the school, but from the home. Yes, yes. I grew up with so many stories about kids that said, tengo miedo, quiero mi mamá, and were responded to with the paddle and the message that speak, speaking in Spanish is against the law. And you're talking to a six-year-old child who's terrified. I had all of these stories in me. So the minute I heard about bilingual education, I decided that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a bilingual teacher. And I wanted to go back to the West Side and teach in the middle schools of the West Side. And then life just presented all kinds of other situations for me. And I have a tendency to say yes to too much. Um, and I'd say yes. Um, I got a bachelor's degree, I got a master's degree, I was applying to all of the West Side schools the very year that teacher salaries were cut $50 a month, and the teacher might only be getting like $500 a month, so $50 was a big deal, it was 10% of your salary, and they'd look at my application at the school districts, and the minute they'd see master's, they'd say, oh, well, don't call us, don't, we'll call you, because we can't really afford to hire anybody with a master's right now. So I thought I wasn't going to have a job. And uh, eventually, um, I got called by a college, Texas Lutheran College, wanted me to direct their Mexican American Studies Center. I'd never heard of a Mexican American Studies Center, but I thought it was wonderful, and I said yes. And so I ended up teaching college when I was 22. I signed the contract when I was 21. And um, it was a very formative experience. And some of my students were older than me. Uh, I was very young and wet behind the ears, but uh, with a lot of luck, I, you know, didn't hit any of the landmines. Sometimes I'd walk right through the middle of landmines. Older faculty members that were envious of me that would set up traps, and I'd just walk right through the middle and not know it was a trap, so I was fine. I went on and got my doctorate. Um, and uh, Guess what? I specialized in bilingual education. That was what was 
weighing on me as one of the greatest injustices that I saw, to take a people's voice away, to keep people from even being able to express themselves without becoming criminals in the system, people violating state law and school law by speaking their native tongue. This was an injustice, and I was lucky enough to see the law changed uh, the year I graduated from high school and to be able to take part in some of the first bilingual education doctoral programs that existed in the nation. Um, and, of course, what comes next is bilingual literature. Where's the literature that reflects Mexican-American culture? Where's the literature that reflects bilingual Spanish speakers? And so that began to pull me. I went into poetry first, and short stories, and then children's lit. And um, I've been able to put a lot of books out there that make me feel very happy for the students and their reaction. Because students, I, I was told at one point in the early 80s uh, that they couldn't keep, this was by a wonderful San Antonio librarian. She says, we can't keep your books on the shelves. I said, why? She said, because kids come in, they see it, and they take the book home and never bring it back. You know? And I said, really? I, she said, yeah, we have to keep it up in the reserve section. And I said, well, maybe we can get enough copies into where you don't have to put in the reserve section. And all of that has changed. And so now I see kids in the Reading Rockstars program with some of my children's books or, or young adult books. And they're doing this too, but they've been given the book to take home. And for some of them, it's the first book they own. I write in very different genres. I'm not a formula writer. You know, I get bored if I have to read, you know, a, a, a romance writer that follows the same formula in every book and has the same plot and the same kind of characters. She just changes the names and changes the setting and, you know, or even mystery writers who do that. You know, anything that's formula, I get tired of. So I have put out poetry books. I put out poetry books that are based on art, that are ekphrastic, they're illustrating what's in the artist's pictures. They're told in the voice of the person in the picture. I like a challenge. I've done poetry of place. I've done poetry for children. I've done poetry for adults. Um, I've done short stories. And then I get bored and I want to do something different. I even have a book on tamales, which is a combination of, uh, Ellen Clark and I did this crazy combination of cookbook, secrets, anecdotes about tamales, history of tamales, geography of tamales, philosophy of tamales. We did this crazy little book and it sold out. The first edition sold out in three days. It was called Tamales Comadres and the Meaning of Civilization. Um, the, my latest book, Arte del Pueblo, is a narrative, a poetic narrative, trying to capture the heart and soul of the art of the city of San Antonio. With, 300 beautiful photographs by Frederick Preston of all forms, all genres of outdoor public art in San Antonio, from, from the tile work to the Faubois Trabajo Rústico at Brackenridge Park and the WPA, the stuff that Dionisio Rodriguez did, um, the murals of the West Side, the sculptures, uh, photography, all different genres, moving digital art projected onto the missions. And he wanted something that would talk about the Mexico Tejano soul of San Antonio. I said, I'll do that. You know, I want to guide the reader in just a few light poetic words through what art means to us and how it tells our history and what our history is. And I feel very proud of this book because it's also very, very carefully not Eurocentric. It doesn't start with the arrival of the Europeans. It starts when San Antonio starts, which is thousands of years before um, any Europeans had arrived here. So it's not biased. And we worked very hard to make sure it didn't have that bias. It started with the First Nations. So it's kind of unique in the way stories go. San Antonio is not 300 years old. It's not you know, just popped up when the Battle of the Alamo started, and it's not just popped up when the Spaniards got here. People have been here 
by this beautiful river for centuries. They've been living here, they've been producing here, they've been creating art here. So um, we're going to have a big event. I invite everyone to come on September 23rd, Friday, September 23rd, from 6.30 to 10 at La Vita, Plaza Juarez. It's free. It's open to the public. It's an event called Arte del Pueblo, honoring the public artists of San Antonio. And many of the artists will be there, will be honored, and um, we'll have a little film talking about um, the art in our town, the Arte del Pueblo, art that is meant for the people, that is owned by the people. Not only that, but if people want to take home a book, they can, they can buy a book and get it signed. Or uh, we will have, we, I love the, this photograph that, that Dr. Preston, Fred Preston took, um, because it shows a, a person in indigenous costume, in indigenous dress, blessing the artwork, thanking the artwork for speaking our voice, for having us in it and speaking who we are and what our history has been. And that front cover is going to be on black t-shirts that Community First was kind enough to order and make for us so that there was no investment of money in it other than the donation. So if you buy a t-shirt, 100% of the money that you pay for it will go towards youth programming at either the Network for Young Artists or SACC. It will go half and half to each of those organizations because they've done so much for young people in the arts. So it's going to be a win-win for everybody. I'm very, very excited and invite everyone to join us for that. San Antonio is a unique city. It's a kind city. It's a city with compassion, but a city also layered with millennia of history and of diversity. And diversity is very important in life. It's, it's the spice of life. It's the meaning of life because each one of us is totally unique. Even if you're an identical twin, you're different from your twin. And yet we're connected like a family. San Antonio expresses that to me. It's a, it's a very universal city. It's very attractive to people from across the world. And we have people from across the world moving here, coming here, wanting to join in this gentleness that this river has always represented for us. Um, it also defines a lot of my art and my philosophy, which is that we need to value uniqueness and diversity. We need to respect it. Um, and we need to enjoy it. I feel that I never stop crossing borders when it comes to writing. I write in every form that I can create or invent or fuse between two other forms. Um, and I would like to see people take that same appreciation and apply it to life and to other human beings. We celebrate in this city. We know how to canta y no llores. We turn everything into a festive, excuse to celebrate and affirm human beings. That's what San Antonio is, and that's what I hope to produce in my writing, that affirmation of human existence. I've been very blessed, and I've had a lot of recognition, uh, and, and that's good fortune. It's, there's a lot of people that don't receive recognition for the work they do, and that's why my philosophy is always very Mexicano in terms of collaboration. We, uh, we believe in giving honor to the entire community because the entire community is what raises us. Um, you hear a lot of talk in the U.S. about the self-made man. The viejitas in my neighborhood get very angry when they hear that story about the self-made man. ¿Cómo que self-made? Que he gave himself his own baby bottle? He changed his own diapers? He mix up his own baby food and eat it like that? Que no, que self-made, que nada. Each one of us is made from the help of a bunch of others. So I am very grateful uh, for those honors. But surely one of the greatest honors I've received, greater than things that were national or even international, um, was to be able to be San Antonio's first ever city poet laureate in 2012, Julian Castro, Mayor Julian Castro. Um, uh, in, inducted me as uh, City Poet Laureate, and we've had five wonderful City Poets Laureate. 
Um, and it was an exciting position because it was a small enough area. I mean, I went on to become state poet laureate as well, but even that wasn't as exciting as being the poet laureate of a community. The state is kind of spread out there, and it was a, a great honor too. But the city of San Antonio, you could sit down for tacos at breakfast, and some viejita across the restaurant would stand up and say, that's our poet laureate over there. You know, I mean, there was that sense of ownership, that excitement that has continued so that people now are asking poets to uh, write something in the concrete on our, on our parks, create a piece of artwork that, you know, reflects us. Uh, give us some of your lines so that we can turn them into songs. I mean, it's, you know, there's been a, a, a great uh, hunger and appreciation of the role of Poet Laureate. And being City Poet Laureate of San Antonio was just an absolute uh, amazing communal experience. In fact, um, I don't know if you want to put this in or not, but within two months, of being inducted as City Poet Laureate of San Antonio, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I thought, uh, I can't stop being City Poet Laureate. You know, the cancer is just going to have to take care of itself. <laughs> I, I did a lot, too. I did a lot of both alternative and, and standard things. I went through everything that I could do to, uh, to make sure that I healed from the cancer. But while I was going through chemo and surgery and radiation, I kept going to the events as City Poet Laureate. And in those two years as City Poet Laureate, I think I covered 330 uh, different events, uh, presenting at them or speaking or leading workshops for, uh, for students. Um, I was very happy with that, but it also taught me something about the specialness of this community. While I was Poet Laureate, the community claimed me. I kind of belonged to them. So when people would call and say, oh, you're going to be going through chemo. Can we bring you soup? Can we bring you? And I'm like, oh, I don't feel like any more soup. I'm, I'm probably not going to need to eat. But I don't have time to make food. I won't have the energy to make food for my elderly mother, who was 94 at the time, my husband, who was suffering from Parkinson's at the time, and my six-year-old daughter. I said, how am I going to take care of them? So they organized. And Monday night, somebody would show up. And on my kitchen counter was a casserole and a salad and a drink. And they, the community showed up, just showed up. Somebody would call me. And she said, hi, I'm Magdalena. And I'm, I'm bringing you some caldo, caldo de pollo, on Sunday afternoon. I said, OK. And my sobrinito was there with me, and he said, Who's coming? I said, Magdalena. He said, who's she? I said, I don't know. But she shows up with this caldo. The community is very beautiful and, and gave back. So it was a collaborative effort. All together, we did the City Poet Laureate ship. I come from a tradition of oral literature. Stories were told. Stories were out loud. So when I would read my poetry, and this is years ago, this is in the 1980s in California or Arizona, or they'd take me up to Chicago or uh, Georgia to do presentations of my, of my work. Instead of just reading poetry, if I was reading in the voice of an old woman, I would make it the voice of an old woman. See, mi hija, y no sabes que that. And they would sit back stunned, and they would say, oh my god, you read 10 poems, and we feel like we met 10 characters. And I said, well, yeah, how am I going to read, how am I going to talk about an old man and use a young woman's voice? I couldn't do that. So they kept saying, you're like an actress. And I was like, I'm not an actress, I'm just a poet, right? But it was a spoken word poetry. It was active, it was performance. So finally, in, the 19, in, in 1990, um, I was invited to, I think it was the Nevada Hispanic Educators Association in Las Vegas. And I said, I'm going to do something a little different. And so I came in. I invented my one-woman show with characters from my poems and stories. And I acted them out on stage. I came in 
through the audience while they were introducing Dr. Tafoya as a blah, 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 who has published blah, 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 and been awarded blah, blah, blah. This little viejita is coming through the audience with a scarf on my hair, lentes, this baston, my chanclas, and a rebozo, and I'm coming in slowly through the audience saying, excuse me, tú no sabes dónde queda el bus stop que va para la calle Guadalupe. And people would look at me funny and like, oh, no, you know, I move away from me. Who is that bag lady, you know? And I would work my way through the audience until I got up on stage. Um, and I would perform seven or eight different voices from the elderly woman bag lady, or what they saw as a bag lady, to the first grader starting school, who's named Tere, and gets her name changed in first grade. Um, and gets her language changed, and gets her culture changed, and gets her view of herself changed. And it's not a very happy story, but the students, when they would see it, would feel affirmed, like, oh, finally somebody understands what I'm going through. So I would do all these different characters. I'd do the elderly GI, and um, he would come out of one of my poems, and I would do the young boy in high school who's about to drop out, I do the young Pachuquita girl who's just so chocante that the teachers can't handle her, you know. Um, and it was to help people understand why people do what they do. And I would end it, I would usually end the performance by sticking on a conference name tag with all the ribbons, speaker, keynote, blah, 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 author, blah, 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 all the ribbons coming off of it, and say, the last character I'm going to perform for you today, as I'm pulling on my business coat, is Dr. Carmen Tafoya you know, conference speaker. And they would crack up laughing. And then I would give my talk as, as who I am. So I kind of made fun of myself in the process of presenting different faces and voices from our Latino experience, from our barrios, from our neighborhoods and families. So um, it caught on and people loved it. And so I started becoming the lunch entertainment or the dinner entertainment for major conferences. I once subbed for Paul Rodriguez, who was supposed to do the dinner banquet for the California Association of Bilingual Educators. And uh, there was a thousand people in the audience and he had to cancel at the last moment. And I was the lunch speaker. They said, could you do dinner instead? We can get somebody to do lunch, but we can't get somebody to do this big thousand person crowd. And I said, sure. And so I come in on my cane and people look at me suspiciously, or they say, you have to leave. Or sometimes they call the security cops on me and come in and the you know, security cops say, ma'am, you're gonna have to leave. Yo no sé de qué está hablando este señor. Oh, she's speaking Spanish to me, and they'd get scared. So, you know, anyway, it, it's been a lot of fun. It started in 1990, and I still do it. Um, I adapt it to the audience. If I'm speaking to high school kids, I do more young kids and people that with messages that relate more to high school kids. If I'm doing it to engineers, I stick a Latino engineer in there and do a Latina engineer usually. Um, you know, I adapt it to who I'm speaking to and what messages they need to hear, but I use the people of my culture to get those messages across to them and that understanding and that appreciation for how much beauty comes from our Latino culture. When a people do not have their own voice, when someone else is telling their story for them, we become objectified and sometimes they get it wrong and stereotypic. Uh, it's very important that we be able to self-define, that we be able to say, this is who we are. And no, we're not all alike. You know, no, we're not all the same. We're very varied, like any culture. We have the full diversity, full range in every way of thought, of philosophy, of lifestyle, of values. Uh, we have some Latinos that are very, very indigenous, some that are very Europeanized, some that are very Mexican, some that are very Puerto Rican. We have a huge diversity, uh, a wealth of diversities within our Latinx cultures. And that's something that we can only express if Latinos themselves are expressing it and say, this is what I feel. This is not what I feel. I don't speak Spanish or I don't speak English or, hey, I speak nothing but el puro Tex-Mex. You know, this is who we are. We're all different. And yet we share this connection 
of, of underlying experiences that kind of inform our variations on a culture, our many variations on a culture. Our voice is our power. It's how we speak up about what we want, who we want to vote for, what laws we want to live by, what we think is fair and not fair, and what resources and opportunities we deserve. So I tell people, make sure that your voice is heard. It might be through writing, it might be through painting, it might be through the style in which you teach in a classroom or serve as a social worker or serve as a doctor. It might be in the way you approach research. Different cultures have something to add. And there are words that exist in our medical and scientific research today that come from Latinx or indigenous cultures. And the word itself is a definition that did not exist in that body of knowledge. So we contribute new concepts, different ways of thinking, and that brings answers, brings solutions to problems. Whenever there's an oppression going on in a society, be it racism or sexism or anything else, ageism, classism, um, that sometimes creates what we call victim blame. We blame the victim of the oppression. It's your fault for being so stupid and so lazy and so poor. Oh, hey, we wouldn't be poor if we were paid a decent wage. We wouldn't be uh, stupid if you had let us into that school, let us attend the schools. So a certain resilience has to be built in there. And we have that in our heritage, that resi resilience. But it's very easy when you're hearing all these messages to internalize them. And, and to think, I must be so stupid, I must be so lazy. When I was first starting as a professional, when I was finished, I thought, for the moment anyway, with my education, I'd finished my master's, and that was as high as I hoped to go. I never thought I could reach a doctorate. That was way pie in the sky. I mean, you know, I had a master's degree, and I was teaching college, and I was so excited, and I was just turned 22, just barely turned 22. Um, I used to come back with a stack of mail from my mailbox that was this high. Letters and whatever in the days before everybody did everything by email. This was 1973, so a long time ago. That stack was so high and I might only work down half of it. The next day I would start over again, another stack and what was left from the day before and I'd work down on that. And I kept saying, I'm so lazy, I'm so lazy. Because in junior high, at Rhodes Junior High, some non-Mexican American teacher had said to me, you're really lazy. And that was the image that they had of who we were as Mexicans, all of us. I didn't realize that had stayed with me and I thought of myself as lazy and finally one of my friends from college came to visit me one weekend and she said, I said, oh I just haven't, I've gotten all these letters and I haven't answered them and, and you know the the, the dean of students wants to do a programming here and I haven't answered this and the such and such and I haven't answered that and I haven't done this. I'm just so lazy. And she said, Carmen, you're not lazy. You're working morning, noon and night and weekends too. And I said, yeah, but I haven't finished all this work. She said, well, look how much work you have. She said, how many people are there on faculty that are dealing with the issues of students of color, of minority students? I said, me? She said, how many employees are there at the college that are Mexican-American? And I said, me? <laughs> and she said, how many? There were, I, it was me and the janitors were all the employees of the college that were not of the white dominant culture. And I began to realize, thanks to this friend saying, what do you mean you're calling yourself lazy? That I was holding on to a stereotype that somebody had laid on me way back when, you're so lazy. I thought, yeah, I'm so lazy. So here I'm working as hard as I can, as long as I can, as many hours as I can, because I'm so lazy. It, it didn't click till then. We all have those things to undo about ourselves. And I was just very fortunate that my family had always told me, tu vienes de una herencia magnífica, de una herencia poderosa. You come from a heritage 
they let me know my history. I knew the history of my family members. I knew my great grandfather's history. You know, they told those stories. I come from a long line of storytellers and the stories kept me alive. I think that I have already been given a gift of having had the opportunity to reach people in South America and New Zealand and Korea who are reading my works and finding something of importance in my works. And sometimes I think the works for children are much more important than the works for everybody else that I write for. Sorry, adults, but you know, children are really hungry and they're soaking things in and they're looking for something that gives them power and permission to realize how magic they are. Uh, my, my second to last children's book, co-authored with Regina Moya, The Last Butterfly, it talks about the magic inside us and how the little boy, when he's looking at the situation of these butterflies that are not going to have a home anymore, they're not going to, they're going to die out because the forest is being chopped down that they, that they nest in and breed in. He says, but I can't do anything to help. I'm just a kid. How many times do we tell ourselves, I can't do anything to help. I'm just an adult. I'm just one person. I'm just this. I'm just that. So never, to young people, I would say never use the word just when you talk to yourself because you're never just anything. You're a bunch of things, some of which are blooming, some of which are starting to bloom, some of which haven't even begun to bloom yet. You're full of possibility. Remember that. Magic, impossible things are going to happen in your lifetime. You're going to see yourself change. And change is a good thing. Change is growth. Change is life. The only thing unchanging is death, except death then transforms itself into life again. So life is a constant change. So don't be scared of change. Don't be scared of growth. Don't be scared of dreaming. Just remember your dreams. And maybe you're going to find a different path from what you think you're going to find. But you'll only discover that if you keep saying yes and trying new things. Don't say yes to everything. But, but say yes to the things that fit within your path, no matter what other people say. Because other people, even your parents sometimes, may say, I know me. Don't, my dad said to me, don't bite off more than you can chew. That was when I told him I wanted a master's degree. Don't bite off more than you can chew. I think he thought it might be too hard and I'd be disappointed or, I don't know, wiped away or in debt or I don't know what he thought, but it just was hard for him to envision. It wasn't out of malicia. It was just, you know, he was scared. He had not reached his potential. My mother had not reached her potential. Neither one of them had gotten the education that they wanted to get. So they were supportive of my getting education. But then, it got carried away. You know, first a bachelor's, now a master's. Give us next thing you're going to be talking about a doctorate. You know, next thing I was talking about a doctorate. Yes. Um, remember that that you know yourself better than anybody. You know your dreams, and those dreams are valuable. They're worth something. They mean you can envision something in life, and if you can envision it, you can do it. <laughs>